Springfield, Illinois, April 6, 1859. Henry L. Pierce and others. And gentlemen, your kind note inviting me to attend a festival in Boston on the 13th in honor of the birthday of Thomas Jefferson was duly received. My engagements are such that I cannot attend. Bearing in mind that about 70 years ago, two great political parties were first formed in this country. That Thomas Jefferson was the head of one of them, and Boston the headquarters of the other. It is both curious and interesting that those supposed to descend politically from the party opposed to Jefferson should now be celebrating his birthday in their own original seat of empire. While those claiming political descent from him have nearly ceased to breathe his name everywhere. Remembering, too, that the Jefferson Party were formed upon its supposed superior devotion to the personal rights of men, holding the rights of property to be secondary only, and greatly inferior, and then assuming that the so-called democracy of today are the Jefferson and their opponents, the anti-Jefferson parties, it will be equally interesting to note how completely the two have changed hands as to the principle upon which they were originally supposed to be divided. The democracy of today hold the liberty of one man to be absolutely nothing when in conflict with another man's right of property. Republicans, on the contrary, are for both the man and the dollar, but in cases of conflict, the man before the dollar. I remember once being much amused at seeing two partially intoxicated men engage in a fight with their great coats on, which fight, after a long and rather harmless contest, ended in each having fought himself out of his own coat and into that of the other. If the two leading parties of this day are really identical with the two in the days of Jefferson and Adams, they have performed the same feat as the two drunken men, but soberly. It is now no child's play to save the principles of Jefferson from total overthrow in this nation. One would start with great confidence that he could convince any sane child that the simpler propositions of Euclid are true, but nevertheless, he would fail utterly with one who should deny the definitions and axioms. The principles of Jefferson are the definitions and axioms of free society. And yet, they are denied and evaded, with no small show of success. One dashingly calls them glittering generalities. Another bluntly calls them self-evident lies. And still others insidiously argue that they apply only to superior races. These expressions, differing in form, are identical in object and effect. The supplanting the principles of free government and restoring those of classification, caste, and legitimacy. They would delight a convocation of crowned heads, plotting against the people. They are the vanguard, the miners, and sappers of returning despotism. We must repulse them, or they will subjugate us. This is a world of compensations, and he who would be no slave must consent to have no slave. Those who deny freedom to others, deserve it not for themselves, and under a just God, can not long retain it. All honor to Jefferson, to the man who, in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence by a single people, had the coolness, forecast, and capacity to introduce into a merely revolutionary document an abstract truth, applicable to all men at all times, and so to embalm it there. That today, and in all coming days, it shall be a rebuke and a stumbling block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression. Your obedient servant, Abraham Lincoln. Springfield, Illinois. April 29th, 1860. Honorable L. Trumbull, my dear sir, yours of the 24th was duly received and I have postponed answering it, hoping by the result at Charleston to know who is to lead our adversaries before writing. But Charleston hangs fire, and I wait no longer. As you request, I will be entirely frank. The taste is in my mouth a little, 
And this, no doubt, disqualifies me to some extent to form correct opinions. You may confidently rely, however, that by no advice or consent of mine shall my pretensions be pressed to the point of endangering our common cause. Now, as to my opinions about the chances of others in Illinois, I think neither Seward or Bates can carry Illinois if Douglas shall be on the track, and that either of them can if he shall not be. I rather think McLean could carry it with D on or off. In other words, I think McLean is stronger in Illinois, taking all sections of it, than either S or B, and I think S the weakest of the three. I hear no objection to McLean, except his age, but that objection seems to occur to everyone, and it is possible it might leave him no stronger than the others. By the way, if we should nominate him, how would we save to ourselves the chance of filling his vacancy in the court? Have him hold on up to the moment of his inauguration? Would that course be no drawback upon us in the canvas? Recurring to Illinois, we want something here quite as much as, and which is harder to get than, the electoral vote, the legislature. And it is exactly in this point that Seward's nomination would be hard on us. Suppose he should gain us a thousand votes in Winnebago. It would not compensate for the loss of fifty in Edgar. A word now for your own special benefit. You better write no letters which can possibly be distorted into opposition, or quasi-opposition, to me. There are men on the constant watch for such things out of which to prejudice my peculiar friends against you. While I have no more suspicion of you than I have of my best friend living, I am kept in a constant struggle against suggestions of this sort. I have hesitated some to write this paragraph, lest you should suspect I do it for my own benefit, and not for yours. But on reflection, I conclude you will not suspect me. Let no eye but your own see this. Not that there is anything wrong, or even ungenerous, in it, but it would be misconstrued. Yours friend as ever, Abraham Lincoln.